Hi there. We'd like to welcome everybody to our sixth we webinar. It's um, CPT applications, uh, specifically on deep foundations. My name is Kelly Cabal, and I'll be moderating the webinar. Feel free to use the uh, chat feature or questions uh, to send me a message, or if you have any questions that I can write down, and uh, Dr. Robertson can answer those at the end for you. Uh, also, if you have any audio or visual issues, feel free to write those under the questions section as well. So uh, I'm going to turn this over to Dr. Robertson, and he will continue with uh, CPT applications for deep foundations. Thank you, Kelly. Well, welcome, everybody, to our uh, sixth uh, webinar in this series of free webinars. As Kelly said, today we're going to focus on the application of CPT for foundation design and primarily deep foundations, although I will touch a little bit at the end on bearing capacity for shallow foundations and then uh, illustrate with a few examples. Um, so just as a reminder, as we've talked before, uh, basically everything I'm going to say is in the CPT guide that's available for download and you can either download it from the Greg side or from the uh, Geologist Mickey uh, software website or from my own website. So pretty well everything I'm going to say is there. The guide's written in summary form so it's pretty easy to read and uh, hopefully you'll find it helpful as a backup material to these presentations. So when we talk about deep foundations, you know, one of the challenges is there are uh, many different types of uh, piled foundations nowadays. They come in all shapes and sizes and that's one of the big challenges of how to try and predict the capacity or response of, of these parts. I'm going to focus primarily on axial capacity uh, today um, and primarily under compression, although extension is, uh, tension is not much different than uh, compression loading. Uh, we can touch on that at the end. Uh, so um, predicting the axial capacity of piles was one of the earliest applications of the CPT. When the CPT was first developed and used uh, in the Netherlands, in Holland, uh, the ground conditions are very soft and, uh, and so most buildings are, are on piles and so very quickly they realized that uh, a good way to design piles was to push these probes in the ground and they were essentially a model of the pile and so uh, methods were developed way back uh, 50, 60 years ago in Holland and those methods have evolved and grown and been improved over the years. So this is one of the applications that's got a long history, a great deal of experience and, and is one of the most popular applications for the CPT. However, one of the complications is, is that there are a large variety of pile types and installation procedures as well as, as ground conditions. And it's really the installation procedure that has such a profound uh, influence on the capacity of a pile. And I've just illustrated it below here. Uh, on the lower left hand one is an example of a, of a board pile. Uh, here in North America they tend to use the term drilled shafts. This is a, an auger board pile and it's with a, a steel casing. But you can see that the ground is excavated uh, and then the concrete cast in place. And then on the right hand side I'm showing um, what is generically, it's a driven uh, cast in place expanded based concrete pile, uh, sometimes commonly known by some of its uh, trade names such as Frankie pile. And so it's a driven pile, so there's a, a steel casing, a plug of concrete, and it's driven into the ground as a large displacement device, and then the base is expanded, and then the concrete is uh, poured, and then uh, the steel casing is, is pulled out. So you can see just in these two examples, one is basically low displacement where you're drilling the hole and the other one is very high displacement. And so the low displacement you're tending to relieve the stresses. Um, less so in this particular example, it is steel casing, but if you used a mud board pile where the hole is supported by mud, that, you know, there is some stress relief. So the horizontal stress has become reduced somewhat, whereas with the driven large displacement pile, the horizontal stresses are increased a lot. So there's a big difference between the shaft resistance of those two types of piles. And of course, the one on the right has an expanded base where you're densifying and compacting the soil around the base, where the other one you're just excavating. So these are just illustrations of how difficult it is to try and predict the capacity of a pile because the method of installation has plays a big role. And an added complication is over the years, um, 
contractors are constantly designing new types of piles and new ways of installing them in various cost-effective ways. And so that impacts the capacity of those piles and therefore impacts your ability to accurately predict their capacity. And we'll come back to this issue and, and why I suggest using a certain approach because it does have a fairly large database that includes a wide variety of different types of piles. So when we talk about actual capacity, I've, I've talked about that it's controlled a lot by uh, details of installation, and few design methods actually account for this. And this is one of the, the challenges, is that um, various design methods or CPT-based design methods of pile design, uh, not all of them account for different installations. Like, for example, some of the um, CPT-based methods are often based primarily on driven steel pipe piles. And so they don't always necessarily work so well on a board pile or a, uh, a drill shaft. Um, most design techniques are, are empirical, and uh, they're built around the concept that the CPT is essentially a model of the pile, a very small model of a pile. But uh, over the years, a lot of theoretical work has been done, and that theoretical uh, work does support you know, the concepts that are used in most of the empirical methods. So there is a strong theoretical support. Um, theory would sort of say there's a number of different constants required, and so the empirical approaches often just uh, took real case histories and then developed those constants from the case histories and uh, previous performance records. And uh, one of the other difficulties is when you talk about predicting the actual capacity of a pile, one of the challenges can be that it's sometimes actually difficult to define exactly what is uh, the actual capacity, even if you do a uh, pile load test and load it until large deformation is actually defining what represents uh, failure. And you'll see later that if it's a pile that's predominantly a friction pile, then maybe it plunges and there's a fairly clear definition of failure. But if it's a pile that's driven to uh, firm ground and so it's primarily end bearing, then when you load it to failure, it just deforms more, and so it can be not so clear on what the definition of, of the ultimate capacity can be. And so you'll see that we'll talk about that, where not just predicting the capacity, but trying to get a handle on what the load deformation is likely to be for that pile. So when we talk about actual capacity, in its basic sense, the ultimate uh, pile capacity, which here I've used the term Q ultimate, uh, is made up of two components. There's the shaft resistance and the base resistance. So QS is the shaft resistance and QB is the base resistance, and that's in terms of load. And each of these resistance, like the shaft resistance, is essentially a unit shaft resistance times the surface area of the pile, and then the base resistance is a unit base resistance times the area of the base of the pile. Now, of course, depending on the the method of installation and the geometry of the pile depends exactly what these areas are. But essentially, the methods are designed to determine what these unit shaft and base resistances are. And you notice the similarity. You know, Q is for the base resistance, F is for the shaft. And you see a certain similarity with the CPT where we talk about QC for the base resistance of the cone and FS for the sleeve friction of the, the cone. So you see a sort of a a similarity in these, but you'll see later that we tend not to use the CPT sleeve friction for shaft resistance, and I'll explain why a little bit later. Uh, but we tend to focus more on the tip resistance to predict both of these unit uh, resistance. Now, when we talk more generically about geotechnical design, uh, it's worth reminding ourselves that there are two basic concepts. There's on the left is the direct approach, which is uh, very common in pile design. It's often empirically based usually based on extensive past foundation performance. Um, less general in the sense of you, you do need to link it to the past performance. So if you want to predict uh, pile capacity, say, for a driven pile, then you really want to use a method that incorporates past performance of driven piles in similar ground conditions. The indirect approach, which is the one you often read about a, a lot in textbooks, uh, is often less empirical. It's based around soil parameters, so you, you first you do something like the CPT to estimate the soil parameters and then use those soil parameters in some sort of analytical model to try and predict the, uh, the capacity of the pile. Uh, it's more general in a, in a 
general concept, uh, but it's often more difficult to apply because of uh, the influence of method of installation and, and how the, the parameters change due to the method of installation. So the indirect one is, is, is more difficult to apply and not always so generically widespread where the direct approach is. So I'm going to focus mostly on the direct methods, but I will just show this one slide about the indirect approach, and they fall into two broad categories, what are often record, uh, referred to as the pseudo-theoretical methods, where you estimate the soil parameters from the CPT and put them into some theoretical solution. So in sands, you, you predict the friction angle, in clays, the undrained strength, and then you put them into some sort of uh, bearing capacity type solution to try and theoretically predict the power capacity. Uh, these are, tend to be less popular, and that's partly because the, the way the piles are installed uh, influences the ground and therefore changes the soil parameters, and therefore makes this approach uh, tend to be unreliable. There are also sort of the general empirical approaches that have been around a long time where the unit shaft resistance is a function of the vertical effective stress and the unit uh, end resistance is some bearing capacity factor times the uh, effective stress. Again, uh, empirical, um, um, uh, less general than the direct approaches. So let's talk about the direct approach and I'm going to talk about the LCPC method and this is out of the uh, the French uh, highways department essentially that's what that acronym stands for Laboratoire de Centrale de Ponts de Chance which is a, the French uh, central highways and bridge department and uh, there's been a number of publications one of the earliest was Bustamante and uh, Giancelli back in 1982 there's been a couple of updates but um, essentially it hasn't changed much uh, and what's nice about it, it's based on over 200 full-scale instrumented power load tests. So these were fully instrumented power load tests, and a lot of them, over 200. What was nice is that they were carried out all over France, so it was a wide range of ground conditions from very soft clays through to essentially soft rocks. Um, and uh, the piles varied from driven piles to cast in place concrete piles, etc. So a very wide range of pile types and groundwater uh, ground conditions. And that's the attraction for this approach. It has an excellent uh, database uh, to build the method. So a wide range of pile types and soil conditions. It uses only the CPT penetration resistance, and this is actually a good feature of it because QC tends to be a little bit more reliable than the sleeve friction from the cone, and so using only the tip resistance is, a, is generally a good thing to do. It's a more reliable parameter and it's easier to use. Uh, it accounts for different pile types and installation methods, and you'll see that when we show it. It has a variety of categories of different pile types, and so you just have to pick uh, what you think is the appropriate uh, category for, uh, for your pile. Ideally, of course, it's best when it's calibrated against uh, pile load test results. So on big projects, uh, you'll use the CBT to get a, an idea of what the capacity is likely to be as a function of depth, and of course, then you, you would perform pile load test to verify exactly uh, what the capacity was. Uh, and maybe uh, just adjusting the method so that you get the correct category of pile that suited the one that you're going to install. So on big projects, often uh, starting off with a, a pile load test program to evaluate uh, the type of pile that the contractor wants to use and compare it back to the CPT and modify the CPT method for the design of uh, the, the remaining piles across the site. So aid in the correct selection of pile and installation category. So uh, the LCPC method has been around quite a while, and there's been a number of publications. There are quite a few of them in the 80s. I did one of them. But what was quite nice is there was a series of publications over just a couple of years where people had uh, a number of KCC, Rio and Tucker had 78. I had access to eight. Tan and Funigard had access to 13. So there's like a there's an additional almost 100 piles here, um, and all of these papers were where people had a number of pile load tests where they had the results. Then they looked at a range of different methods to predict the capacity, and all of them essentially said that the LCP was one of the best methods uh, in terms of CPT-based methods for predicting these pile capacity. So the LCPC was based on over 200 piles, and it's been evaluated on over 100 other piles that were independent of the initial database. And then, of course, it, in more recent years, there's been more publications doing similar things, uh, generally showing that 
LCPC method is, is typically uh, in the top uh, two or three in methods for predicting capacity. Now, I do give credit to LCPC, you know, that they have a pressure meter based method as well as a CPT based method. We're, of course, only going to talk about the CPT based uh, approach. Now, one of the big things when we talk about power capacity is the scale effect. And the, the cone is quite small, you know, it's uh, essentially 30 seven millimeters in diameter for a 10 square centimeter cone or 44 millimeters in diameter for a 15 square centimeter cone. So it's, it's not very large, uh, whereas often we're installing piles that are significantly larger and you know, possibly as much as a meter or even two meters in diameter, so significantly larger. And we know uh, when we talked about pushing the cone, and we talked about this zone of influence, this essentially a, a spherical um, zone of influence as you push any device into the ground, whether or not it's a pile or a CPT. And the zone of influence is a function of the diameter of the probe uh, and the stiffness of the ground. And so we know that when we push the cone in, if you had a soft clay then a, a overlying a dense sand, is the cone will continue to feel the soft clay as it penetrates into the dense sands. And so it needs to penetrate maybe about 10 cone diameters into the sand before it no longer feels the influence of the clay and starts to reach its true uh, base resistance in the sand. Uh, but, but it only needs maybe uh, about a thir third of a meter to a half a meter of penetrating into the sand before it no longer feels the clay. But if you drive a, a one meter diameter pile into the same ground, the zone of influence is much larger. So now that pile has to penetrate about 10 pile diameters before the pile reaches its true base resistance in the sand and no longer feels the influence of the clay. But if it's a one meter diameter pile, that could be up to 10 meters that it needs to penetrate. And so, of course, if you take the tip resistance of the cone uh, near the, the top of the sand layer and then try to predict the capacity of the pile at that same depth, then you need to account for the fact that the pile is of a larger diameter and it's still being influenced by the clay above. So you have to account for this scale effect. And most methods do. They all tend to do it slightly differently. Uh, some may be slightly better than others, but uh, you know it's all built into the empiricism of the approach. And, uh, and for LCPC, they had a, a specific way uh, to account for that, and I'll describe that in a second. So for the LCPC method, for the unit base resistance, it's relatively simple. There's an equivalent um, CPT tip resistance uh, at the level of the pile tip, so there's an average cone resistance at the pile tip surface, and you'll see it apply that by this empirical bearing capacity factor that's a function of the pile type and the ground conditions. So this is how the LCPC suggests to do the um, averaging so here's your pile, and at the base of the pile, you've got the cone profile. And basically what they suggest you to do is calculate the average cone resistance over three pile diameters, basically one and a half pile diameters above and one and a half pile diameters below. But that's the, the, the initial average cone resistance. And then what they suggest doing, which is quite clever, is they suggest removing the high and low points that uh, represent any high points that are greater than um, 130% of that preliminary average, so greater than 1.3 of the preliminary average. You, you remove those high points, and you remove the low points that are above, but you keep the low points below. So if there's a little soft clay layer below the pile, you'll keep it in, but if there's a thin sand, dense, thin, dense sand layer below, you lop it off. And the logic behind that is the pile, of course, has a larger zone of influence. So the cone being quite small, if you had a, a, a small sand layer, maybe only uh, 100 centimeters uh, thick, you know, um, four inches thick, uh, then the cone will sense that, and so you'll get a spike in the data. But a large one meter diameter pile is barely going to notice that little thin sand layer. And so the method says by removing that high point, you're removing this uh, excessive influence of this small spike that the cone experienced, but the pile will have less experience of. Um, and likewise, the low points above then are going to have much effect, but the low points below, so if you had a thin, soft clay layer below, that will influence the, um, at least the low settlement response in some degree, the, the capacity, and so the method keeps that in. So it sounds complicated, but you, you, you basically calculate the average cone resistance over 
uh, three pile diameters, one and a half above and one and a half below, and then you just modify it by lopping off these peaks and, and the, the troughs above. And then with that average, you then multiply it by this bearing capacity factor, and they have this table. Uh, recently, they, they updated the publication and, and actually produced uh, graphs for these, but I still quite like the simplicity of the table. Uh, and they designated, at least for the end resistance, two pile types, group one and group two. Group one is essentially the low displacement piles, you know, such as the plain board piles, the mud board piles, micro piles, cast board piles, hollow auger board piles, etc. So these are the types of pile where you're essentially low displacement, you're often excavating uh, and then pouring the concrete. And group two is often the high displacement piles where they're essentially casts uh, in place screw piles, driven precast piles, pre-stressed tubular piles, driven cast piles, you know, driven uh, grouted piles, driven metal piles. So group two is the high capacity piles. And you can see if you go into most of them, you see group two has a larger factor than group one. So allowing for the fact that they're anticipating that the group two piles will have a, a higher bearing capacity uh, even though the, it, the ground conditions are similar. And uh, uh, the LCPC method identified a range of categories of soil types. And you'll see later that the, the software typically converts these uh, these descriptions of soil, you know, like soft clay where the tip resistance is less than one megapascal or less than 10 tons per square foot, etc. Um, you can go into this, the non-normalized soil behavior type and identify that zone and then the, the program identifies the soil type and then applies these correct these bearing capacity factors. And then for the unit shaft resistance, similar, now there's a summation here because of course the you sum it up over the length of the pile because the tip resistance is constantly changing. So if you're measuring the tip resistance every two centimeters, then every two centimeters you calculate the unit shaft resistance. And the unit shaft resistance is whatever the, the tip resistance is at that location divided by this empirical friction uh, coefficient. And likewise, the empirical co uh, friction coefficient uh, has a range of categories. Now they've got more of them. Essentially, it's six categories. You've got category one, two, and three, and each of those are broken into subsets A and B. And so that's why there's a sort of more complicated description below. But again, category one is the low displacement. Category two is the high displacement, and category three is really the the um, impact part, the ones that are very high displacement. And three is like the driven grouted piles driven rammed piles, high pressure grouted piles. So these are the ones that really do change the, um, the horizontal stress quite a bit. And remember, you're dividing by this uh, constant. So um, uh, the smaller the number gets, then uh, the, the bigger the unit shaft resistance is getting. Did I get that right? Yeah. Yes. Um, and also, uh, in terms of friction coefficient, uh, there are some limits. So you see. Uh, you've got category one and two, but under category one, two, and three, there are these maximum limits. And this is being somewhat controversial about uh, whether or not these limits are correct. And you'll see later that uh, sometimes it's useful to estimate the capacity both with and without the limit and see what the effect is and make some judgment about whether or not you, you think the limit uh, is applicable. And certainly the limit is conservative, so that by limiting the unit shaft resistance, um, it limits that you, you don't use numbers that get too large. And the reason for that limit is, is um, a wide range of factors, but again, it's to do with the installation that there's only so much um, increase in stress that you can create from the installation method. So what you're going to end up with is you've got a, a cone resistance here, you know, QC versus depth, in the variable ground conditions, and then you're going to calculate here in yellow the shaft resistance, where you're basically calculating that unit shaft resistance and you're summing it up as you work your way down the pile because the, the surface area of the pile progressively gets bigger as you go further down. And then you add to that the base resistance and the two added together is the ultimate. I like to show the two because it shows the two components and you'll see later that that's what I recommend. And so the yellow one is, in this case yellow, is the shaft and then you add on the base to get the uh, full ultimate capacity. 
Now, uh, what factor of safety do you use for sort of the allowable capacity? It depends on the reliability and sufficiency of the field data, how complex the ground is, your confidence in the method. In other words, um, how does this method relate to the types of piles and the ground conditions you're dealing with? And that's one of the reasons why I recommend the LCPC method because it does have such a wide range of application. And then previous experience with similar piles and similar soil conditions and whether or not you've got pile load test uh, data available. Generally factors of safety are up around two to go from ultimate capacity down to allowable capacity. LCBC actually suggests that it's a factor of safety of two on the shaft resistance and that's because the shaft resistance gets mobilized at very small displacement. So the, the shaft resistance gets mobilized very quickly. Whereas they recommend a factor of safety of three on the base resistance, and that's partly because often the base resistance requires a large amount of displacement, you know, maybe 10 to 20 percent of the diameter of the pile. So, you know, a one meter diameter of pile, that means that you're going to have to go um, 100 millimeters of displacement before you fully mobilize that base. And so if you're talking about allowable loads where you want deformations to be controlled, then they suggest higher factors of safety. We'll come back to that issue later when we, we sort of talk about the load displacement. And in fact, I think this is where we begin to talk about it. So when you want to look at the load settlement response of a single pile, now obviously groups of piles uh, have group effects, which, which I won't go into, uh, but if you have closely spaced piles and, and you've got a large group, then they begin to behave as a group. But if we just focus on a single pile right now. It's controlled by that combination of shaft and base resistance. And essentially the side resistance gets mobilized at small movement, typically somewhere around only half a percent of the diameter, D is the diameter, or typically sort of closer to five to 10 millimeters. So about a quarter of an inch to maybe half an inch of, of displacement. And then the base resistance is mobilized at much larger movement depending on the actual pile type and ground conditions, uh, but nominally around 10 to 20%. Again, depending on the ground conditions, obviously if you've got like a soft rock that will mobilize the resistance quickly, then the number is smaller. But if it's sort of uh, relatively medium dense sands, uh, then you might in fact require 20% you know, displacement before you mobilize the full base resistance. Um, so you know, if you've got a friction pile where it's, it's predominantly shaft resistance uh, and the base resistance is very small, so shaft resistance is much, much larger than the base resistance, then quite often you get a plunging failure at quite a small displacement. Whereas if you've got an end bearing pile where the base resistance is much, much larger than the shaft, then there's often no clear failure because it requires large uh, displacements to generate that base resistance. And settlement criteria are often controls. And hence, there's often uncertainty over the, the definition of the ultimate capacity for end bearing piles. So let's illustrate that. So here's a, a single pile, and it's got the two components, the shaft resistance and the base resistance. And so if you look at the sort of these um, normalized versions of the buildup of shaft resistance, so here's the shaft resistance uh, normalized by the shaft resistance at failure. So it goes from zero to one. And you can see that it gets mobilized quite quickly. Uh, may drop off a little bit, but essentially it rises very quickly at a very small displacement, somewhere between five to 10 millimeters, and then drops off. And uh, the displacement is normalized by the displacement as a function of the diameter of the shaft. And then for the base resistance, again, normalized from zero to one, the base resistance normalized by the base resistance of failure, plotted against the displacement as a function of the diameter of the base of the pile. Then you can see it typically gets mobilized much slower depending on the pile type and ground conditions, but you know, not unusual to go all the way out to 10%. So this basic concept, if you, if you just use this very simple concept, you can get an idea of what the load settlement response is going to be. So here's an example of a friction pile. So a friction pile, the base resistance is very small and it will get mobilized quite slowly, whereas the, the shaft resistance is very large and gets mobilized very quickly. And here is a reference I've drawn on the sort of the elastic compression of the pile uh, freestanding. So this is just the load times the length of the pile divided by the cross-sectional area and the Young's module, so the stiffness of the pile. And so the elastic stiffness of the pile. And so what you basically find is that for a truly frictional pile, 
then as you start to load it, you of course build up friction at the top of the pile, and then you slowly you build up the friction all the way down the pile. And when all of the friction is essentially mobilized, if there was truly no end bearing at all, then once all of the friction is mobilized, the pile will plunge. And of course it will do that when essentially it hits its elastic uh, compression. So you often find that the shaft resistance is a little stiffer than the elastic compression, and then eventually when it reaches failure, it, it, it plunges. And when you add these two components, you get the total one, and you see you often get this very nice curve of it's very stiff and relatively small displacement, and then it tends to plunge in failure. So uh, ultimate capacity is fairly clearly defined, and working loads are often uh, with factors of safety of two or three. They're way down here. And so you can see at working load, nearly all of the load is carried by shaft resistance, almost none of it on base resistance. And then when you go to a, a pile that's predominantly end bearing, so the base resistance is much, much larger than the shaft resistance. So here you can see shaft resistance is growing, shown in green here. It gets mobilized very quickly, but is of a smaller magnitude. The base resistance is of larger magnitude, but requires much more deformation to fully mobilize it. And when you add those two together, you tend to get this, this curve that has uh, less of a clear failure uh, um, value. So failure is sort of up around here where the bend is. So many different methods try to define them. Often it's 10% of the pile diameter, so it's up around here somewhere. Uh, and again, at working load, when you come down to uh, the, what's being mobilized at working load, then even an end bearing pile is, is often predominantly shaft resistance at working load with a relatively small component of base resistance, even though it's considered an end bearing pile. So at working load is often carrying a fair bit of its load in, in shaft resistance. And a good example of an end bearing pile would be um, a, a belled pile, so uh, uh, a cast in place auger pile with an expanded base, uh, so a bigger base diameter than the shaft, which is why the end bearing gets so big. So let's look at some examples. Uh, there are, uh, there's, there's not a, a lot of good ones to look at, but I'll show you just a couple. This is uh, the Amherst site, the University of Massachusetts. We showed this uh, profile earlier as an example of a CPT profile. But this is a varved clay, uh, so it's sort of like a, an over-consolidated crust near the surface, and then it's essentially a normally consolidated clay from about six meters on down, and the large excess pore pressures. These little spikes, uh, this is not to do with the virus. These are just where dissipation tests were done approximately every meter. So these little uh, spikes in the pore pressure are just where dissipation tests were, uh, were carried out. And so a pile load test was done here. It was a drilled shaft or a board pile. It was a, quite a large one, almost a meter in diameter, four, four meters long. And the, uh, the calculated capacity from that um, pile load test was about 1,200 kilonewtons, or 120 tons, roughly. And uh, here's the, uh, the CPT profile, and, and I'll show you the software that did this. It's, it's, it's part of the CPT uh, package. And so you've got the cone profile, the soil behavior type, and then in here the, the, the red line is the buildup of shaft resistance, and then the blue is when you add in the base resistance. And this is with factors of safety. Here I put a factor of safety of one because we're comparing it with the measured capacity. So I, I put in factors of safety of one. So although it says allowable power capacity here, it is the ultimate power capacity. And you, see, you can see it sort of predicts that there, in the upper crust there was quite a high capacity and then it tends to drop down and then build up again. And as is so often the case, the, the CPT was not pushed deep enough really. They, they, didn't, they should have pushed um, at least three pile diameters past where the um, end of the pile was done. So the pile was essentially stopped at 14.3, so they, they should have gone about another three to four meters past that, so they should have gone to about 18 meters. But you can see if you, if you just project on uh, in that straight line, it's a, it's a pretty good uh, prediction of the capacity. And uh, so here's the sort of predicted load settlement, that very simple approach. So here's the measured one, this sort of, uh, I've shown it is a sort of a broken curve here, that's the measured one. Uh, so at about 1,200 uh, kilonewtons, the, the deformation was about four centimeters um, for this pile. And uh, so the, the blue line down here, this is the buildup of shaft resistance, because it's a normally consolidated clay, so it's very small, uh, developing low. The red line is the shaft coming on very quickly. Uh, and the input parameters here was 
basically saying 5% displacement for the shaft and 20% for the base. That's the only uh, assumption needed. And then the black line is adding the two together. You get this rather simplistic uh, linear, um, bilinear um, load settlement predicted response. And it compares not too bad with the measured one. You know, given how simplistic the approach was, it's, it's not too bad. Here's another example. This is much stiffer ground. This is a, a residual soil from the Piedmont area, you know, in uh, in Georgia. Uh, this uh, published by Paul Main at Georgia Tech, so it's sort of one of his local sites. So much stiffer soil. Um, so uh, although the cone re resistance looks relatively low, you have to look to see that they are quite large numbers. A very dilative pore pressure. Uh, Professor Main also measured the shear wave velocity, and uh, so they, they did a, a, a 910 uh, millimeter diameter uh, drilled shaft again, 19.2 meters long. Again, the CPT really wasn't pushed deep enough, but if you look at the, um, the um, profile of capacity versus depth, if you sort of project it on down uh, to where uh, they actually did uh, install the pile, it's pretty good agreement again. And um, so it's not, not a bad example. Uh, and I, I want to now jump to uh, you know, the, an alternative approach to the load settlement. And Professor Main and others have published this sort of approach. Uh, Professor Main had one in, in uh, year 2000. And he essentially took the Poulos and Davis elastic solution and uh, you know, uh, from the shear wave velocity determined uh, what a representative modulus of the soil was. And, quite nicely softened that modulus as a degree of loading. And, and we'll talk about uh, this a little bit later. I think I did talk about it when we, when we talked about estimating modulus from CPT, and that's what he's done. He's actually got it from the shear wave velocity to get uh, the small strain Young's modulus and then softened it as a function of degree of loading, and then stuck it into the elastic solution by Poulos and Davis. And uh, he applied it onto this drilled shaft from uh, a site in Alabama. This is a residual soil. There were eight drill shafts, and I, I apologize, it's in, in Imperial, but it's three feet, so it's roughly a meter in diameter by roughly 10 meters uh, deep. And it was a dried cast um, um, drilled shaft um, with bentonite dry polymer slurry and a liquid polymer slurry. You can read about it in Professor Main's paper. Here's the CPT profile, uh, you know, sort of in a way typical residual soil, um, you know, large uh, friction, relatively large tip resistance, very dilative pore pressure response, and shear wave velocity averaging about 200 meters per second. And uh, so here's the prediction. So uh, the blue line is the predicted base resistance compared to the uh, measured one from the instrumented pile. The red one is the predicted shaft, and the red dots, the measured shaft, and then adding the two together, you get the total. And then the, uh, the continuous line is that sort of elastic solution by modifying the modulus uh, as a function of degree of loading. Uh, so you can read more about it in Professor Main's publication. But it's a good example. Again, CPT-based method worked very well. And even uh, you know, the slightly more sophisticated uh, elastic solution for the load settlement response. So in summary, you know, the CPT provides uh, reliable profiles of ground conditions. It's fast, cost-effective, continuous, and reliable. LCPC method is very easy to apply. And what's nice, it has an excellent track record. It's very simple to use. And it has a large database. Uh, so it, it, it's applicable to a very wide range of piles and ground conditions. Obviously, it's best when it's calibrated against pile load test data. But certainly, it's very easy to use, gives you a sense of, uh, of what the capacity and the load settlement response is likely to be, and how the capacity varies with depth. And uh, that it's been incorporated into the software CPT, and I'm going to illustrate that in a few minutes. But before I do, I just want to touch on bearing capacity. Although we're not going to talk about shallow foundations here, I want to just touch on bearing capacity. I, I have had a, a couple of questions recently. And when I do talk about shallow foundations, I want to focus more on the discussion of settlement. So I just cover bearing capacity here. And there are a number of direct methods for CPT. Uh, there's been a number of publications, but they're all essentially the same. They break the soils into either coarse-grained or fine-grained. And the ultimate uh, bearing capacity is basically some 
uh, bearing capacity factor, some constant, times the average cone resistance. And the average cone resistance is calculated over a depth either equal to the width of the footing B or, or one and a half times the width of the footing. Um, that varies a little bit depending on the ground conditions. And certainly, and for sands, uh, that number varies, but it, it's around 0.15 to 0.2, and illustrate where that comes from. Here's a little plot of this, this uh, bearing capacity factor against um, B over D, so it's the width of the footing B over the depth, so sort of it's the inverse of what we're used to. So when that number is low, it's a deep one, and when it's, um, that number is big, it's a shallow footing. You see at the shallow footing end, it sort of varies from about 0.15, possibly to as high as 0.3 for square footings um, in very dense sands. I sort of typically take the lower value of about 0.15 or 0.16 to be precise. That's what we had recommended back in 96. And there's been a number of more recent publications all coming up with essentially uh, the same sorts of values. And for clays, fine grain soils, same thing. Uh, it's, it's a slightly different constant. The, the number's a little bit larger, sort of closer to 0.3. Some people have said as high as 0.4, but 0.3 is not a bad number. It does depend on the uh, the depth of the footing, the footing shape, and the stress history and sensitivity. But these are, are, are not bad numbers, and I'll illustrate this when we go to the software. So I'm going to uh, change over to the software. Uh, it's called C Petite, um, and it's uh, uh, sold by Geologist Mickey in, in Greece, and John Ioannidis is, is the developer, and we work very closely with John in developing this uh, program, and Greg helps sponsor it, so it helps keep the price very low. It sells for 199 euros, so a little under $250, so excellent value for money. We highly recommend people use it. I use it all the time. Uh, and just before I close out on the slides, just as a, a plug for uh, CPT 14, which is next year in uh, Las Vegas, uh, so it's the third international symposium on cone penetration testing. So if anybody has any sort of projects you've been working on that uh, you'd like to write a, a little paper to, then uh, please submit your abstract and go to the website uh, www.cpt14.com and you'll find out more about it. So let's switch over to um, the, uh, the software. Um, so here it is here. I'm going to open it up. I hope I'm going to open it up. Okay, my, my, this is what happened last time, is my, my computer got frozen a little bit from uh, the slide. Okay. Uh, this is typical of what happens with a live presentation. Here we go. Um, so here's the software. We, we, we discussed it last time. So I'm going to sort of skip straight to um, where I'm going to open an existing uh, project. And Kelly's correct, is that uh, because we were transmitting on the slideshow, everything's running a little bit slower now. Um, and it's not wanting to respond to my commands. Um, let's just pause a second here. Um, Yes, yeah, so while we're waiting for, um, for my computer to settle down, uh, some people did ask a few questions. So uh, verify which group auger cast piles or drill displacement piles is a group one or two. Uh, typically, most of the um, newer uh, piles are, are relatively high displacements. So you know, most auger cast piles or certainly drill displacement piles would fall into category two. And what you'll see with the software is one of the nice things with the software is the ease at which um, you can change the category and see how much it affects the capacity and uh, make some judgment about how you want that to work. Um, so the contractor says equivalent or a replacement for driven piles, not uh, an excavated method of installation, still a displacement. And that's generally true. The, the newer piles uh, tend to all be a higher displacement, and that's partly because, of course, they get higher capacity when they are displacement piles. So uh, that's why a lot of the contractors are moving to these sort of more innovative ways to install large displacement 
uh, piles without having to have um, uh, big pile driving equipment around. Um, sorry, you can see I'm still trying to get my computer to fully wake up. So the next question, LCP was most uh, likely based on instrumentation of small diameter piles uh, back in the 80s in today's highway bridge validation data. Piles tend to be much larger or more. Uh, what's the confidence level for very large diameter piles? Yeah, um, that's a good question. And it's essentially that's correct. Uh, it was mostly um, bridges back in the 80s, so they, they were uh, smaller diameter piles relative to some of the really big, uh, really big ones now. Um, so I've got, we're, we're back online with the piles. I'll, I'll come back to that question. Um, so what I've done is I, I quickly opened the software and I've got a number of uh, example profiles. Uh, the first one was the one we looked at last time. I'm just going to make the plot a little bit bigger. This was that site that had eight meters of soft clay over about 10 meters of stiff clay over a dense sand. So here's the basic plot. You see the soil behavior type clay over a stiff silty clay over a dense sand. You know, the soil behavior plots, you know, soft clay, stiff clay, dense sands. Um, so uh, nice profile. And so uh, in the software, that you scan across the top here, there's a little module for pile design. But maybe what I'll do quickly is, is go to the, the bearing capacity one since we finished on that. See this little uh, module up here says bearing capacity. So if you click that, you get this little window that pops up and it basically says, okay, what range of footing? So rather than do the calculation for one footing width, it says you can vary it and it's going to give you a little graph of ultimate bearing capacity against uh, the footing width. So let's say uh, we want to go from like half a meter up to like a five meter wide footing and we're going to go in steps of 0.2 of a meter. And uh, um, since the hand order, I'm going to put the footing two meters down and we're going to check over one and a half times the width of the footing. I could change that to one. I'm going to include the weight of soil, so I'm assuming we are going to backfill around the footing. And here's this constant. Uh, so remember for sands it was about 0.16 uh, and clay is about 0.3. So you can see the program defaults to a sort of average value of 0.2. I'm going to keep that for now and we'll just see what happens. So if we calculate, you can see you, you get this, what looks like a funny plot, but just change the scales. So Go the minimum value up to maybe about 500 kPa. And so that now it looks a little bit better. So you've got ultimate bearing capacity against the footing width going from half a meter out to five meters. And you can see that it's pretty flat because remember this is a soft clay down to eight meters. So it's a pretty low ultimate bearing capacity of a little over 100 kilopascals, maybe about 125 kilopascals is the low point there. See, for very small footings it's a little bit higher and that's because there is a, a little bit of a crust um, when we started pushing the cone one and a half meters down. Um, so if we push for, right from the surface, there is a crust here. So you, you would have got a slightly higher uh, bearing capacity for very small footings and then it drops down lower into the soft clay and then begins to build up. If I actually increase the footing width up to as high as 10 meters, now you'll see it really begin to take off and it, it's a much larger number. Um, so it sort of says it's low uh, ultimate bearing capacity and then you start mobilizing the resistance of the stiffer clay. Now you may not actually believe all of that resistance for the stiff clay because this is a very soft clay and so if you had a very wide footing, you know, 10 meters wide, um, that's almost as, as thick as the soft clay, then the soft clay will tend to get squeezed out. So I wouldn't necessarily believe all of that high capacity here. So it basically uh, confirms that the ultimate bearing capacity would be uh, about 125 kilopascals. So keep that in mind if you wanted to do a settlement calculation, that would be your guidance for that. And there is a, a settlement module up here, um, and I'll, I'll just illustrate how you would do it. So in this particular example, if you had, like, like these were circular tanks maybe, and uh, maybe they are five meters in diameter. And remember the ultimate bearing capacity was about 125, so I'm going to about put about um, 50 kPa as a reasonable working load, and the embedment's two meters down. Um, the footing is flexible. Uh, I'm not going to remove all the soil. I'm, I, no, I, I, so maybe we will remove it. And um, we'll do the full calculation. And uh, so there's the 
calculation of, or the estimate of settlement. And so you see settlement against depth, and you see you get a curve now. So it's basically saying there's going to be about four centimeters of settlement for this five meter diameter circular footing with 50 kPa applied footing load. And that's a factor of safety of about two and a half to three on the ultimate bearing capacity, so it looks about reasonable. You see in this particular case, all the settlements in the soft clay, none of it's in this uh, stiff clay or the sand. The program does have a feature where you can add in um, uh, some creep, maybe five years worth of creep, and then uh, add that into it. You see it, it, it actually predicts quite a bit more um, uh, settlement because the clay is very soft and you get this secondary consolidation. But we're going to go into that uh, more in a, in a later presentation. I really want to go on to the pile module, and the pile module is right up next to it too. And so it, it's very simple. It basically uh, asks for some input data. It defaults to the factors of safety that LCPC recommended, which is three on the tip and two on the shaft, and the uh, restrictions on unit shaft resistance supply. And it, it says, okay, tell me about the pile. And it says, okay, is it a solid or a pipe pile, and how large is the pile? So we'll make this maybe a half meter diameter pile. And uh, we'll make it a driven pile, so it's a group two. And for friction, it's uh, maybe 2A, which is a, a driven precast concrete pile. Um, and uh, for, the, um, for the limits, it's a, it's a 2A, so we'll apply that. And then... Uh, the method talks about careful construction, uh, you know, minimum disturbance, or a correction on the, the, the limits of that. So we'll just select that now and ask it to calculate it. And uh, I'll just adjust the scale out a little bit to 2,000 kilonewtons. Um, and so here's the plot. So the red line is the allowable shaft resistance. You know, accumulating as you go down, then the blue is when you add on the base resistance. And you see you know, very little added base resistance in the soft clay, then it begins to pick up in the stiff uh, clay and then picks up quite a lot in the sand. Uh, so basically it says that if you were to drive a pile down around 24 meters, then the uh, allowable pile capacity would be about 1,500 uh, kilonewtons. If you want to know what the ultimate is, you, you switch the factor of safety to 1 and recalculate and change the scale. Um, and then essentially it's a plot of ultimate power capacity. So at 24 meters, the ultimate power capacity is uh, up around three, just over 3,000 kilonewtons. But let's go back to uh, the factors of safety that we had before. Um, change the scale again. Uh, make the plot look a little bit better. Uh, so now it says, well, if I, if I were to drive this pile down to, let's, let's say, 22 meters, uh, it says the uh, allowable capacity is about 1,200 kilonewtons. So if I want to look at the load settlement response, there is a little tab that allows you to make that estimate, and you have to put in the depths. It says 22 meters. And then all it's asking for is, is the relative displacements. So here, here it's defaulting to 5% for the shaft and 20% for the base. Now you might think 20% is a little aggressive. We'll go for 10. And uh, it's a half a meter diameter pile, so 5% is not too bad. Um, we'll ask it to calculate, sorry, calculate it here, and then look at the load settlement response. So here's a plot of the um, load capacity against uh, settlement. The blue line is the base resistance coming on rather slowly. The red line is the shaft resistance coming on quite quickly. And the black line is when you sum those two components together. Very simple sort of bilinear uh, relationship, so it's very approximate. And then the green line is the calculated uh, allowable uh, capacity of the pile. So, you know, it's just under 1,400 kilonewtons. And so you can see it at, at that working load, it would say that the pile wouldn't deform very much, and it would be nearly all shaft resistance, very little base resistance, even though you've driven it down to the dense sand. So that's, that's one example. Let's go to a slightly different one now. This is a um, San Francisco Bay Mud, and, and all these plots are to the same scale. So this is basically a crust and then a normally consolidated, very soft clay. So again, if we put in here, choose a pile type, um, Let's again, well, let's choose a, a larger pile, one meter diameter pile. And uh, uh, maybe we'll choose group one because uh, it's a 
board pile. Uh, ask it to calculate. And uh, so here's the plot. And of course, there's no data for the upper a meter and a half, so it starts at a meter and a half. So a little bit of a crust uh, shows up, but then essentially as you go deeper, it's, it's essentially a friction pile. Uh, most of its shaft resistance, very little end uh, resistance. So you can play around with the effect of pile type if you changed it to group two, let's say 2B, a high displacement pile. And then recalculate. Uh, you know, the, the, you see that it didn't have a massive uh, effect on the capacity. Uh, yeah, because I fixed the scale at the bottom. Uh, the capacity did go up a little bit, but not a lot because it's a, a friction pile, so it wasn't quite so heavily influenced. Uh, let's look at an interbedded profile now. Uh, which one do we want to? This one here. So this is a, essentially soft clay with interbedded sands. Uh, so you can see essentially soft clay with these sand layers. Uh, there's a thicker sand unit down around uh, 24 to 30 meters. This profile went down just 30 meters. Um, so again, pick the pile type. Let's again go for a half meter diameter driven pile. We're going to group two. Ask it to calculate. And uh, you can see mostly shaft resistance, a little bit of base resistance. And the base resistance, of course, builds up in each of the sand layers. And now what you would notice is that uh, we, we put in a half meter diameter pile. If I made it a larger diameter pile, then what you would find is that the uh, sand layers play less of a role. I mean, obviously the capacity goes up, but you know, you've got to have the, the thinner sand layers play less of a role. It's only the thick sand layers that play a role. Uh, so you know, just to summarize, the, the, the LCPC method is, is not perfect. Uh, but it is very easy to apply. It does allow, you know, especially with software like this, digital data, it does allow you to quickly uh, play with a number of variables to see how the, the capacity, but not just the capacity of a, a single depth, to see how the capacity as a function of depth varies and to get a, an approximate idea of what the load settlement response is like to, uh, to be and you get to control uh, what you think the expected relative displacements would be. So let's go back to the questions. Uh, you know that the, the last question we had was about the diameter LCPC being uh, an, an older method, therefore mostly smaller piles. So how well does it apply to larger piles? And of course, in the offshore industry, they're driving very large piles, and LCPC method has been used for some of those piles, and and does do a reasonably good job. So it does seem to scale up reasonably well. The one criticism would be is that you know their method of calculating that average cone resistance for the base resistance of only three pile diameters is quite small because other methods go as much as eight pile diameters, and the LCPC method is only three. So one criticism is that maybe they're not averaging over a large enough uh, zone. And when you go to very large diameter piles, maybe that plays a bigger role. Um, but you know, often when you go to really large diameter piles, it's still mostly the shaft resistance is controlled a lot by the method of installation. So it's really picking the right uh, category that's going to try and capture your type of pile. Um, so I don't know if I answered that question fully, um, but I think in general, it, it, it's, it's a good method to apply. Now, some of the other questions about what are the other methods. What's the view on the Imperial College method and similar methods of calculation, uh, actual capacity? Now, the Imperial College method uh, is a newer method. Uh, it's, it's more sophisticated. It's more complex. Uh, so it's a little bit harder uh, to use. You need to put a lot more inputs into it. Um, but in a generic sense, it's still very similar. Um, so it, it's, a, it's a matter of personal taste. I, I really haven't um, embraced that much of the Imperial College approach, partly because it does require more inputs. It's harder to program, et cetera. Uh, requires a lot more judgment. Um, and I think if I'm correct, uh, it, it certainly doesn't have as large a database as the LCPC one. And the database tends to be more dominated by the driven uh, piles, driven uh, steel pipe piles. And that's true of some of the others. You know, uh, uh, Bank Felenius's method um, uh, is mostly uh, driven piles, and uh, and it uses effective cone resistance, which I'm not a big uh, fan of, particularly in softer soils. Um, next question: How to make corrections in QC data 
when we encounter dilative pore pressure, such as over consolidated clays. Mm. Um, I'm not quite sure what corrections you want to make. I mean, if you have dilative soils, uh, well, let's go back to that first profile, and, and you know that stiff clay, it was dilative. Uh, it's very hard to make any corrections because the tip resistance that you're measuring, of course, is controlled by the effect of stress in the ground, and so if it is a, a dilative over-consolidated clay, then it is dilating, it's very stiff, so you get a larger tip resistance. So the measured tip resistance is already responding to all of these characteristics. I'm not a big fan of, of trying to take the pore pressure and correct the tip resistance. This is what the uh, Bank Felenius's PAR method, it uses an effective cone resistance. So it's QT minus uh, the, the pore pressure from the cone. So of course, if you've got a soft clay and there's positive pore pressure, you make that number even smaller. And if you've got a stiff clay with negative pore pressure, you make that number even bigger. So he, in a way, by doing that, they try to amplify the tip resistance. But in the end, of course, it's all bedded in the empiricism because all of these numbers have to get uh, multiplied by some empirical constant that's also a function of soil type. So it's all buried into the empiricism. What I don't like about the effect of cone resistance, and, and this would be a good example, this very soft clay, is if, if I just go to illustrate um, the values in the middle of the soft clay, you know, the, 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 the QT is about 0.3 to 0.4 megapascals, and the, uh, the pore pressure from the cone is about 0.1 megapascals, 130 kilopascals, so 0.1. So you've got 0.3 tip resistance, and then you've got to subtract 0.1. So now you're down to an effective tip resistance of 0.2. Um, if, if this was a more sensitive clay where the pore pressure was larger, you can get cases where you know, the tip resistance might be uh, 0.3 megapascals or 300 kilopascals, and the pore pressure is 250 kilopascals. So you subtract the two, you get a really low number, and that number is, is not very accurate. And so then to go into an empirical method and try and use that would be difficult. Now, to be fair, if it's that soft a clay, you're not going to get much uh, resistance from it, and so therefore it's, it's embedded in the, the empiricism. But overall, I'm not a fan of using the effective cone resistance. Um, then there's one uh, opinion about using LCPC method without using the upper limits of skin friction. Heard this gives more uh, accurate results. Yes, I, I did mention that, that there is some controversy over these limits. I think the, the limits were elements of conservatism, uh, and certainly um, as we've gone for bigger piles, uh, particularly offshore, where this whole issue of what the limiting values are going to be. Now, certainly research has shown that there are limiting values. The issue is what are they and, and how do you control them? And certainly the LCPC limits do tend to be very conservative. So again, if you're using it for preliminary design, you probably want to build in that conservatism and not be too aggressive. But if you've, if you've got the ability to do pile load tests, then often you can sort of remove some of that conservatism. And you saw from the method there, you've got the option to um, deselect. The little button here, you can deselect. So I can take off those limits. So here we had, what, uh, a half meter diameter um, driven pile. And if I, so here's the plot below. Uh, so if I take off the limits, you can see what the effect is. And you see, as you got deeper, it bumped it up a little bit. So in this particular one, didn't make an enormous difference with or without uh, the, the limits. But on some, in some ground conditions, those limits uh, do matter, particularly for the, uh, for the large displacement piles where you, you do calculate these very large uh, unit uh, shaft resistance and the limits uh, tend to limit how high it can go. So views on difference in capacity of driven versus vibrated piles. Well, again, you know, these are all issues about the role of, of uh, uh, pile installation. It plays a really big role. You know, this is a complex topic. We're, we're clearly just summarizing it here and summarizing in terms of how you might use uh, CPT data. Uh, but clearly the way the pile is installed plays a big role in, in the capacity and it's obviously a function of the ground conditions. Now, if you've got loose sand, we know that driven displacement piles do tend to densify the sand, so they, they improve the capacity of the pile by densifying the sand. And if you use vibratory uh, driven displacement piles, then they possibly will compact the sand even more, and so will improve the capacity. But if you had very dense soils, that vibratory uh, role 
may work against you and may in fact loosen the sands a little bit. So it's very sensitive to the, the type of ground conditions you're in and you have to use a certain element of judgment. Now, next question, constant K, can it be estimated from IC instead of using single values for sand silt clay? Uh, yes, in fact, you know, the, the, the chart, it was a function of soil type. And to keep it simple, what we've done is we essentially um, go into the non-normalized soil behavior type chart and using the categories that LCPC used, which was essentially just the, the cone resistance, and the description of the soil, we basically drew lines across the chart and said, well, if you fall within these zones that match the LCP region, um, then you could do it. But we could be more sophisticated and you know, go to the normalized chart and use soil behavior type index as a better category of soil type. The difficulty is, is the, the empirical design methods didn't have that data, so they didn't embed it into the method. So it's hard how you, how you build upon that. Uh, experience and those are the things that are likely to evolve over time and improve with the methods. So um, next question, discuss calibration of predicted and measured capacity. Um, so I think what you're talking, you know, these methods you're clearly predicting the capacity and how you might calibrate it against the measured one. And it, if it's a large project, you know, as I said, ideally you'd like to um, do a pile load test with the um, method of piles that you're expecting to use. And of course, when you do the uh, pile load test, uh, rather than just focusing on capacity, what you should do is in a way, you know, the, the method predicted what the load settlement response of the single pile was, and then compare that with the measured one, and then adjust the category and the relative displacements to get a better match. And then that's how you would sort of calibrate the predictive to the measure. So rather than just focus on the, the capacity value, but actually try and calibrate that load settlement response. So if I could just go up, remember, up here we have that load settlement response, the calculator. And so here's sort of the, the predictive, sort of simplistic, bilinear, um, or in this case, trilinear um, load settlement response. And then you, you know, compare that with the measured load settlement response and then play around with the categories and the relative displacements until you get a reasonable match and then feel that that's how you calibrate the method. Um, so you're saying discuss remaining CPT methods for power capacity. Are they less accurate or more accurate? You know, such as uh, UniPAR, for example. And there are, you know, there, there are literally hundreds of, of pile design methods uh, and CPT based pile design methods available. They've evolved over the years. The newer ones tend to be a little bit, uh, the, the Imperial College one being a good example of uh, sort of updated versions trying to capture more of the, our knowledge about the theory and how to adjust the methods. Uh, but they, of course, they tend to be become more complicated. And as I said, um, quite a few of them tend to be focused more on certain types of piles, and that's often forgotten. You know, like a lot of them are often based on driven um, steel pipe piles, and so if you're doing mostly a different type of pile, then those methods may not apply. So it's always good to, to read up about the method and get an understanding of what their database uh, was comprised of. At both in terms of ground conditions and pile types and make sure that that matches reasonably close to what you're trying to install, your ground conditions and your type of pile. Um, do you usually consider the resistance calculations for uh, superficial crust and soft layers? And the answer is no. I mean, if you're looking at pile design, typically you're going to ignore that, that crust for various reasons. You know, if it's a bridge, uh, it might get scoured away and removed anyway. So you have to decide what you're going to do with the surface material and how that affects your type of pile and, and your project. Um, so we've got quite a few questions here. I'm just reading through a few of them. Uh, so yeah, are driven piles covered? Yes, they are. Um, ah, yes, so does the program CPT account for uh, any uh, effects such as liquefiable layers to be discarded, etc. Uh, and the answer is no, it doesn't. I mean, that's something you would have to do. I mean, the, the, our next webinar is about liquefaction. And so you, you, know, you, you have to then 
determine whether or not liquefaction is likely to occur and then what role that would play on the power capacity. Here you can see this is a very simplistic approach of how to get some understanding of the power capacity and the load settlement response and then you have to decide uh, how other things uh, affect it such as liquefaction, scour, down drag, etc. Uh, some of that's covered in the CPT guide, you know, in a very brief way. Uh, you know, pile design is a big, complicated topic, and we're clearly just touching on it here. Um, uh, can you use CPT for power capacity if you have changes in grade? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so, in other words, if you're excavating, yes, that's true, uh, because the CPT, of course, is is telling you what the ground conditions are now. If you were to add fill or excavate is going to influence uh, the response. Now, if you're only adding or excavating small amounts, it's not a big factor. If you start excavating a lot, it does uh, uh, affect it. Um, and uh, that, that's a tricky question. Um, I'd have to think about exactly how much it affects it. Obviously, if you're adding fill, you don't know what the resistance of that fill is like. You have no cone data in it. Uh, it's obviously going to increase the overburden pressure. So you know, the, the, the shaft resistance and base resistance is going to get bigger because you've added in that overburden. Likewise, if you remove it, it's going to get worse. So yes, excavating or adding fill will affect, and, and uh, ideally you need to have the cone data after that's been done. Um, oh yeah, no, this is a trickier one. In the uh, load and resistance factor design world, LRFD, um, a resistance factor is used and hence the value of resistance factor needs to be evaluated in the LCPC method. Ooh, that's a lot more com That's a complex question about um, clearly th this methodology was using global factors of safety, of, you know, uh, three and two for base and shaft. And if you go to factor design, life's a little bit more complicated. But that's usually covered, you know, like the Euro code uh, is a code and so it defines exactly how you're going to do it. Um, and so it, it usually defines the method you're going to use. So both, you know, how do you do the site investigation? Now the Eurocode often, it's focused on soil parameters. So they often don't use these direct approaches. They're usually focused on soil parameters. And so it's embedded, um, the, the factor approaches is embedded in that methodology. So if you're going to go to load and resistance factor design, usually it's a codified approach of which you have to follow the rules. Um, so last question that we'll finish off with, can you use QT instead of QC in LCPC? And the answer is yes. Um, and in fact, uh, I'm pretty sure the way CPT, CPT does actually use QT instead of QC. Now, of course, in, in sands and in, in stiff clays, there's essentially no difference. It's only in very soft clays that there's a bit of a difference. Um, and since in soft clays, you're not going to get much resistance from the pile. It, it's a very small effect of uh, whether or not you have the, the two in there. Um, so, may, okay, here's the last question just to finish off. Neglect friction to a, uh, a certain depth in software. I'm not quite sure what that question is. Um, you see that in our soundings, you know, quite often we hand over for the first one and a half meters, so we're missing that data. And so clearly we're missing it in, in the prediction of the capacity. And that's usually not that big a deal if, if you look uh, at the. Yeah. Um, you can you can get to control of the data. You know, one of the nice things the software has is it it has an edit feature. You know, where you can edit the CPT data, and you can um, you can remove portions of the data. So if you've got cone data right from the ground surface, but you're going to say, hey, I want to I want to discount this for various reasons. So you can edit the data and, and put in things like hand auger, equivalent of hand auger, or lost data. Um, in that upper few meters, whatever you want to exclude, and edit the data to remove it. And once it's removed, of course, it's no longer uh, included in the, the calculation. So there are ways to, to trick the software um, to do that. And, and uh, that's certainly uh, one way around of doing it. Um, so I, I think that's maybe a, a good place to close here. I'll, I'll finish uh, showing the slide, um, just as a reminder what the topic was. Uh, hopefully you found that interesting, and certainly from the range of questions, it illustrates that there are a lot of interest in this topic. It is a big, complex topic. You know, people spend one or two days talking about uh, pile design, and so clearly in one hour we've only just uh, touched on it, but hopefully it's given you a sense of how CPT can be used and um, how software can, can make the, the application relatively simple, but the key is you have to use your, your own engineering judgment 
uh, to modify how the calculation is done to what you think is really going to happen with your type of pile in your type of soil, and the CPT is giving you that continuous reliable data uh, as, a, as a basis to make those judgments. So hopefully that was uh, of interest, and uh, we look forward to you possibly listening to the next one, which is uh, almost a, a month from now. We're going to talk about liquefaction in our next webinar. So that closes us out.